Salams, this is People's Dispatch and you're watching the Daily Debrief coming to you as always from our studios here in New Delhi with me, Siddhantani. Uh, on the show today, we're looking at what the foreign ministers of the G7 grouping had to say at the end of their meeting uh, in Nagano in Japan and of course how the rest of the world is receiving that communique. Uh, we also talk about what a second term for Miguel Diaz-Canel means for the people of Cuba. And finally, the WHO has launched a data repository, the first of its kind. We look at what this uh, means, what kind of tools it holds and how it will empower policy makers in the public health sector. Uh, first up, the G7 in its communique at the conclusion of the meeting that I was mentioning of the foreign ministers in the city of Nagano, which hosted the Winter Olympics, of course, uh, once upon a time uh, in Japan. The Western-dominated group called for, wait for it, the denuclearization of North Korea. In a statement that many commentators are calling insubstantial, they also called out Russia and others, while completely glossing over the fact that members of this very grouping uh, need to be at the center of the global push for denuclearization. Anish joins us now via video chat for a further exploration of the latest in an ongoing absurdist drama. Anish, uh, activists in the nuclear disarmament space have responded quite uh, unequivocally to the statement uh, by the G7 foreign ministers calling it empty uh, and, and not having any sort of concrete, any substance to it in terms of uh, the parties that are actually holding uh, the vast majority of nuclear weapons, nuclear warheads uh, in the world today. Uh, and also, sort of, uh, the irony of this whole situation is that Hiroshima will host uh, the G7 summit uh, in about a month from now. Uh, what, what do you make of uh, the, the statement, uh, North Korea being mentioned in it, and, and the whole stand that the G7 has taken? Yeah, no, I think we can... Yeah, <laughs> it is. That's a, it's, a, it's an interesting situation right now, because uh, previously we never seen such... Uh, interest by the G7, at least in the recent times, uh, on the North Korea's uh, nuclear uh, weapons. Uh, not because it wasn't of an interest to them, it was just that it wasn't something that they thought was necessary to have a communique on. Uh, now, in this case, we're not very sure what kind of messaging they're trying to say. Obviously, there have been some missile tests. Now, missile tests are not the same as a nuclear test. And so North Korea has not really violated uh, uh, any kind of, uh, as our, uh, if you go by some of the statement uh, made in that uh, communique, uh, where they allege that North Korea has violated uh, Security Council resolutions, uh, it hasn't really done any of that sort uh, in recent times that we can think of. Nevertheless, uh, the statement is uh, made and it targets very clearly uh, the North Korean uh, nuclear ar arsenal for basically no good reason. And so, and obviously there is that hypocrisy because uh, considering the fact that the, the head of states uh, are going to meet uh, in Hiroshima, uh, the first the first ever uh, nuclear bomb detonated site of that, uh, and uh, we will have the United States talking about and its allies talking about. Uh, a smaller countries, a smaller nuclear arsenal, while they hold about thousands in their own kitty, uh, shows a certain now, hypocrisy. The to have actually used one of these weapons. Uh, on exactly, our... exactly. So all of these factors and the fact that uh, the United States has recently not really worked towards actually uh, completing the nuclear disarmament goals that it has set for itself and for the rest of the world as well. So there is no attempt to talk to say countries like uh, Russia, France, UK, China, which are uh, you know legally allowed according to international laws mm. to hold nuclear weapons, or for that matter, countries like India, Pakistan, and uh, whether or not uh, what depending on which side you are, uh, Israel as well, uh, to actually uh, deal with the uh, to actually do away with nuclear weapons as a whole around the world. But uh, obviously, the st specific targeting of North Korea is definitely showing us that there is... And we also need to look at other parts of the communique where they're focusing a lot on the Indo-Pacific, on China. So it is very clear that they're, apart from Ukraine, obviously, it is very clear that they are trying to focus a lot more tensions uh, in the East and Southeast Asian region. And uh, that is definitely... Uh, a sign, uh, so to say, uh, of G7 trying to 
may be uh, salvage its relevance in today's world uh, where you know some of these countries are not really that major economies to begin with uh, but uh, or for that matter it is trying to uh, you know uh, raise a certain kind of war or a, uh, you know war like rhetoric uh, in a time when uh, tensions are flying high uh mm-hmm. in literal terms even uh in the region uh so that is definitely a sort of disturbing uh development that we are looking at right now and so a trend anish in, in so many ways we've spoken about so many of these issues on daily debrief as well before uh, we've talked about the united states is uh, own uh, sort of take on uh, a, a upholding treaties that it has entered into and how it unilaterally decides to exit when when the time is inconvenient or or convenient for it uh we've also talked about the statements made by south korea's uh, president ahead of the visit to the united states and and so so the timing of it seems uh, like this process of drumming up uh, cold war era you know uh, narratives uh, and bringing in all sorts of players into the situation but but essentially kind of creating this sense that there are lines uh, yeah. Uh, yeah yeah uh, so it's going to be quite uh, interesting well interesting is the most mildest term to use it's going to be something that we really need to watch out for because uh, as i've said uh, multiple times before and uh, the risk of reiterating myself uh, this is one of the regions which hasn't seen conflict uh, or la- large scale conflict in decades in uh, for nearly more than half a century and okay. at this point in time when you are trying to drum up uh, cold war rhetoric uh, not only against north korea but also china Mm. uh it is going to be a uh, significantly problematic for everybody involved and not just and we're when i'm saying everybody involved it's basically the whole world at this point yeah. so uh and we have to remember when we we also need to talk about how with the whole talk about north korean denuclearization we need to remember the korean peace process that was uh basically uh you know thrown under the bus because of the united states own uh, sort of uh brinkmanship uh, in the region uh it included denuclearization as one of the as one of the aims of the whole peace process and this was something that the two koreas had decided on mm-hmm. so when something of that sort uh, an achievement on itself uh, like something of this scale uh was completely disregarded because of us's own foreign policy problems and its uh, you know gestures and statements and you know uh, provocations yeah, yeah provocations in the korean peninsula it shows that the us is and its allies are not really that concerned about whether or not there is a nuclear free korea or for that matter a peaceful korea uh, but uh, just the fact that they want to target north korea at this point in time and you know cre- use that as a proxy to target uh, some of the countries that are not on say unfriendly terms with the with the north korean government and its administration so which is which includes obviously china russia but also other countries in the third world uh, who still maintain a certain kind of relationship which is just not neither friendly nor unfriendly so it is sort of that uh, you know a very pragmatic position and countries are being forced to take such unpragmatic positions and as you said blinds are being drawn for no good reason when that shouldn't be the case many of these issues are quite you know something that countries can deal with themselves if they talk talk it out and you know, use space. diplomacy exactly and rather than giving space to that interfering in such situations is definitely going to amplify whatever tensions we are seeing right now and that is the most disturbing part at this point Mm-hmm. i can't imagine that some of it is also not geared up to taking attention away from the recent stories of leaks and other things where uh, so many of the us's g7 allies uh, are very much a part of the story all right but th- thanks very much for that update uh, anish uh, today and have a good weekend next up cuba's national assembly voted in miguel diaz canel as president of the island nation for a second five year term a decision that is being viewed in terms of maintaining stability and continuity in the face of a deep economic crisis a crisis of course that's been fueled by decades of blockade and economic sanctions by the united states 
the legislative body voted overwhelmingly in favor of a second term for Diaz Canal. Uh, Zoe has more. She's been covering Cuba uh, extensively. Uh, Zoe, what are the challenges ahead in, in terms of this second term for Miguel Diaz Canel? Miguel Diaz Canel was elected uh, for a second term as president on Wednesday, April 19th. He was elected by Cuba's National Assembly, which was in turn elected on March 26th in the legislative elections. Uh, he was elected alongside Salvador Valdez Mesa, who is serving as vice president and also the head of the uh, the leadership of the National Assembly was also elected this day. Uh, there are major challenges ahead for Miguel Diaz-Canel. Already in his first term, the first five years that he served as president, he had to face some of the most uh, challenging years that Cuba has had to face. Um, this includes both the intensification of the blockade under the Trump administration, uh, looking, for example, the over 200 measures, the unilateral course of measures that were imposed by Donald Trump, uh, his administration during his presidency, uh, the inclusion of Cuba on the state sponsors of terrorism list, uh, and both of the uh, motivations or justifications for both of these moves, the increased unilateral course of measures and the inclusion of Cuba on the state sponsors of terrorism list, both of the reasons that uh, the Trump administration gave for actually taking these actions have been proven to be uh, not legitimate, uh, have no base, um, but still Diaz-Canel has had to face this moment in which already Cuba's limited ability to engage in financial transactions with uh, foreign banks, not even banks in the United States, but banks in Europe, banks across the country, across the world, uh, engaging in any of those transactions has become extremely difficult. Um, trade any sort of cooperation, even medical cooperation, uh, Cuba's ability to buy medicine, ab ability to buy food, all of this has been made more difficult um, with these measures that happened, of course, during the Trump administration. And then in 2020 is when uh, the COVID-19 pandemic starts, which puts Cuba, again, in a very, very difficult situation. It's a country that relies a lot on tourism and of course, in order to protect its population, Cuba closed its borders to the world uh, for many months. Um, they lost, of course, this revenue from tourism, which is, again, one of the biggest uh, external contributors to the G GDP. So a lot of lost income there. But uh, Diaz-Canel has really taken on these challenges with an extremely... Um, uh, a position that's of great commitment to the revolution, of continuing uh, Cuba's process. Um, and I think that in the coming period, there's definitely going to be continued challenges, um, even though Joe Biden, who's from the Democratic Party, who was Obama's vice president, Obama, of course, historically started to warm the relations between Cuba and the United States. And despite uh, Biden having some promises of changing and reversing some of the Trump era policies, all of these do remain in place. So these challenges continue for Diaz-Canel. And of course, uh, Washington has also been very interested in uh, intensifying political opposition and fomenting different groups into taking actions. There's been uh, Diaz-Canel, of course, had to face the very challenging day of uh, July 11th when people were on the streets um, upset, of course, because of the socioeconomic conditions that they're subjected to because of this blockade. Um, but from there, of course, it's been the justification for Washington to impose and to have rhetoric about human rights in Cuba, about the silencing of protests, of dissent. And so all of these factors have kind of come together in the last several years, not to mention the natural disasters that have hit Cuba, the different hurricanes, um, the fire at the Matanza supertanker facility. These have been tremendous, tremendous challenges with, for Cuba, for the Cuban people, for the Cuban government, and of course with Miguel Diaz-Canel uh, at the head of all these efforts. So uh, it's likely that these challenges are going to continue. Um, and uh, it's it remains to see how uh, the the... The international pressures against the blockade, against U.S. policy against Cuba, uh, will play out. Will this actually cause, uh, force the U.S. to change um, their approach towards Cuba? This will make it a lot easier for Cuba to survive and thrive. Um, but it seems like that's going to be a lasting challenge.
Right, and in continuation from there, what has been the policy direction so far for those who might be a little bit uh, less informed on what's been going on in Cuba uh, that Diaz Canel has taken? And are we likely to see him build on it or maybe are some changes necessary? So as I mentioned, there have been tremendous challenges for Cuba in the last several years and in the five years that Miguel Diaz Canel already served as president, many of these challenges remain. And so far, his his orientation towards these uh, tremendous difficulties facing Cuba has not been to shy away from the goals or the dreams of the revolution, which have to do with guaranteeing health care, education, um, and the a good uh, standard of life for the people. Uh, Miguel Diaz Canel has not uh, given up on these promises and of course has, has even tried to bring the revolution and take it even further. So under his uh, leadership, Cuba passed one of the most progressive codes on families that uh, exist in the world, legalizing same-sex marriage, redefining what it means to be a family, giving more rights to children, to elderly people, to disabled people. Um, he's taken forward many, many important initiatives across the country um, and across the world and in the region. So as Latin America has become uh, every day more and more progressive, with more progressive leaders being elected, um, Miguel Diaz-Canel in his leadership has been at the forefront of many of these regional initiatives, um, not only regarding uh, these political issues of sovereignty regarding the United States, but also economic cooperation amongst the countries, medical cooperation. Uh, Miguel diaz Canel has really insisted on the importance of medical cooperation with many countries after different disasters that have taken place over the past several years, including the COVID-19 pandemic. Medical internationalism has remained at the forefront of the country's strategy to engage with the world. Um, also very important initiatives in addressing inflation on, on a regional level. So it, we're likely to see continued, and especially with the changes that have happened in the region, continued regional cooperation um, being a priority under Miguel Diaz Canel's leadership, uh, continuing to deepen the revolution, expanding people's uh, understanding of politics and their political rights, um, continuing uh, Cuba's commitment to free and quality education and health care and a standard of life. Um, the challenges continue. Cuba's in a very, very critical moment, um, but uh, Diaz Canel has showed that this is not a moment to abandon uh, all of the promises that the country made and that the people have fought so long for and sacrificed for. Right, thanks very much, Zoe, for that update. And finally, the WHO launched yesterday the Health Inequalities Data Repository. It's a global accessible repository, the largest of its kind, and designed to equip a host of stakeholders in the public health sector, whether it's government or NGO, uh, with information and tools to better tailor the delivery of vital programs and interventions. Basically, it aims to uh, get policy design more streamlined, to be more locally effective, while also allowing for better informed decisions at the macro level. And Avrachar of the People's Health Movement has been looking at these developments or this repository uh, and has this to say about how it might work or might not. Anna, this is quite a major uh, sort of data repository. Nothing like it exists currently uh, in the world. So uh, plenty of potential, I, I would imagine. Uh, yes, definitely. So this uh, new repository of uh, global health inequality data that the WHO launched um, the idea behind it is to actually look at the data in a different way. So for now, you know, we uh, we get the data, but it's uh, it's uh, it's not it's aggregated. So we don't usually have the breakdown into different elements. We uh, this is interesting because it uh, it provides people, researchers, activists, and uh, you know, people who actually make the policies to look into uh, how. Uh, the health of uh, specific populations is affected by some things uh, in um, in the world. So, for example, you know, uh, it's uh, it's a very big repository. So it looks at different aspects. It looks uh, looks at how COVID nineteen, for example, impacted mental health mm -hmm. among people uh, from different uh, education backgrounds, from different economic backgrounds. Uh, it also co compares, you know, how, for example, maternal and infant uh, health is going in different parts of the world, but also then broken down into uh, income categories. Um, and ideally, 
and it's a very, very ideally, uh, it should mean that uh, the governments that are thinking about improving their health policies can now look at this data and say, okay, so we have a major problem in this field. Let's do something about that. Uh, we have uh, the WHO has provided us with uh, the technical guidance to do it. So, you know, ideally, uh, we should be able to come up with uh, targeted policies that can actually make a major difference in the lives of people. Mm. But then on the other hand, you know, we, we, we already know that this kind of thing, it's a bit of, uh, it gets messed up. So it's not, um, uh, in the past also, um, it has been shown that data collection is essential. So we cannot work if we don't have access to, da to data. Uh, but it's not all about it, of course. Then, you know, you, you do need the resources to actually sit down and to look at the data and say, okay, I have money to do this. Mm -hmm. If you don't have money to do this, then it's uh, it, it can get very frustrating. Mm -hmm. uh, also, I, I suppose one of the first challenges would be that, yes, the WHO is providing the technical know-how and how to do this. Uh, but much of the reporting as well as the compi or the input of the data would come from the very same governments that are then uh, using this tool, yeah. Uh, yeah. which, uh, you know, across the spectrum of at least low and middle income countries presents all sorts of issues. Yeah. Uh, and I think that's a very good point because, you know, different countries report on different things. So if you look at the repository now, uh, for example, you'll find uh, data on... Um, well, actually, you'll find plenty of data from low and middle income countries, which are uh, stepping up in the reporting mm. and are really making an effort. Mm. But then even if you look at some uh, formally classified high income countries like Croatia, Croatia mm. has reported on very few of those things which the repository wa wants to address. Right. Uh, so it's uh, it's still a process. Uh, and also it's something that I think that the WHO is counting on, that it's something that's going to take time that uh, it's also going to uh, to take some pressure and some encouragement to countries to actually, you know, feed into this repository and make the most of it. Mm. So, so uh, if quickly, if we can, like, so if I, if I'm a, a country that is being asked to sign on to this database, and if I say, I already know what my specific health concerns are. And in fact, I, you know, so I don't need the rest mm -hmm. of your data. I'm, I'm happy with what I have. How do you sort of respond to that sort of attitude if, if at all it drops up? Well, I mean, it, it depends uh, on how, uh, uh, on what kind of data do you, do you already have. If you have the very elementary da data, uh, I think that mm, now it's already understood or at least shared, you know, um, shared approach mm. uh, that it's not, it doesn't address the specific problems that we want to address adequately if mm. you uh i don't know if you look at uh the impact of covid-19 on a population let's say you want to look at uh, people who with high education you also need to look at how it if it impacted differently men and women of mm -hmm. this this education background you cannot just take one uh one category and then say this the the solution that I make for this will cover all. It won't. Mm. Uh, it actually makes it easier for you. It not easier. It's uh, it, it takes more time, but it more makes yeah. yes, and yeah. it makes more. Uh, it makes a greater impact, which is yeah. what we want to achieve at the end of the day. Thanks very much, Anna, uh, for that, and and we will of course uh, see how that goes, but also speak to you uh, soon for more updates, probably next week. Until then, have a good weekend. Thanks. All right, this was our last episode of the Daily Debrief for this week. We'll be back on Monday, but in the meantime, our website will be up and running, of course, and when we'll have updates and stories as always. We invite you to head there to check those out. It's peoplesdispatch.org. Uh, also, don't forget to follow us on the social media platform of your choice. We'll be back on Monday. Until then, have a good weekend. Goodbye.